Welcome to I Love to Tell a Story, a podcast on the Narrative Lectionary. I'm Rolf Jacobson. I'm Catherine Schifferdecker. I'm Joy J. Moore. This is the podcast for February 22nd, 2023, which is Ash Wednesday, and it is Matthew 18, 1 through 9. It's the debate about who is the greatest, or at least the question, and then some uh, stories about children, uh, you must become like a child, and finally the saying, uh, if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. So what do you guys make of the question from the disciples? They come to Jesus and ask, who is the greatest? I, I, I might connect it to what we, uh, to the previous chapter, right, uh, that we talked about, uh, or you guys talked about last week uh, on the transfiguration, right? So they're just... I don't know how much time has elapsed, but but narratively speaking, chronologically speaking, this question happens, this debate happens soon after the transfiguration. So you can imagine Peter, James, and John, and then the other disciples uh, hearing about it, this, this, you know, awesome event, this awe-inspiring event where Jesus is transfigured and becomes like the sun and his clothes become dazzling white and Moses and Elijah, they are so, as they're mulling over this, as they're thinking about this, I, I would think it would be kind of a, a naturally human question to come up. Well, if Jesus is, right, like Moses and Elijah, if he is the Messiah, then uh, what about us, right? What, where, where is our place in, um, in the kingdom? Who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? So I don't know that it's particularly... Um, uh, praiseworthy, but I think it is um, maybe a natural question, right? If if Jesus is the Messiah, if Jesus is, uh, you know, the Holy One, then what about us who are following him? I appreciate that looking back and setting that context. I, you know, I always uh, d- desire to do that. Um, I read this uh, by looking forward, uh, anticipating where these um, next several parables and teachings will be will be leading us. Uh, and um, so I'm actually uh, going to even jump into the second section uh, that Ralph kind of reminded us we're moving into, um, a woe to the world because of stumbling blocks. Um, in our use of vocabulary today, we... we we have given words meaning individually, and we've lost the shared understanding. Uh, we we want to uh, be uh, given an opportunity to speak, but we're not we're not always trying to communicate so that others uh, can uh, share the the understanding, and that's sort of how we read these at least the next few parables of Jesus. It's like, oh, these are so confusing. I, I don't, I, I wish Jesus had spoken plainly, um, except for I think that there was more of a shared understanding of imagery, of uh, allegory, of events, which actually causes us to understand what you just said, uh, Catherine, Moses and Elijah. Okay, these must be the greatest because these are the two that were shown dazzling with the Messiah. So where's the next line? So they got it. And and then and Jesus says, um, uh, the greatest is going to be a child and then shifts and says, um, but woe to those who are stumbling blocks. So... Um, Our greatest stumbling block might be our vocabulary. And so if, 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 if you, if you got me with that, then I want to look at the word humbled. Um, because when I'm going to use this idea of when a child wants to learn a new language, they don't care about mispronunciations, which I just mispronounced. Um, or um, using a word out of context because they're learning. And we might sniggle a little bit when they mispronounce something, but we know what they mean because they're 
building this new vocabulary. It's really hard for adults to learn a new vocabulary because as soon as we stumble, we shut up, we shut down. We, I, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to embarrass myself. And humbled is this word about being embarrassing or being demeaned or being tempered. And if we anticipate the parables that are coming, that some of them seem very hard. I think they're hard because we don't want to be embarrassed or demeaned or tempered. And if we be like a child and say, I'm going to do this even if I stumble, then we become great, the greatest. I, that was a long way around that, but uh, I, I think that allegory that is happening here um, moves from a select of the best to who's the greatest learner and the greatest learner is a child. Yeah, I think that's right. The, um, the, uh, the word humbled and the word welcome, which are contrasted here, are part of the ancient cultural values of honor and shame uh, in both the Old Testament and New Testament. And some of it is the idea that who you welcome, uh, if you welcome in someone who is honored, that brings honor to your household, or at least you share in their honor. It might be a better way, what you share in. And obviously humbling yourself is not what one expected one to do in a culture that valued honor and shame. We still have some degrees of honor and shame in our society, but nowhere near the the, the sort of cultural, literal, sorry, not literal, a figurative currency that they had in the ancient world. So the the way that these two words uh, play off each other, if you become humble like a child, no one would want to do that. No one would want to uh, take on the on the opposite of honorable behavior. And then what n few people would want to do is then welcome those who had been humiliated. And so what I think what you're seeing here is um, the way Jesus, through the Beatitudes that we started with, through his teachings, through the parables that we're going to see, is saying that the way of following me, the way of uh, the way of the cross, is uh, what it does is automatically turns the the values of the world upside down. And to follow Jesus, one must live a life that's informed by those that upside down kingdom, as some people have called it. So we need to address uh, that's all really helpful, and I appreciate that contrast between humility uh, and the the welcome of you know, someone who's honored. Uh, we, the, the last part of the, um, the, the reading from verses six through nine. So if any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were fastened around your neck and you were drowned in the depth of the sea. I mean, that, that's harsh. Plus, uh, if your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. Better for you to enter life maimed or lame than to have two hands or two feet and to be thrown into the eternal fire. I think it's important to note that uh, Jesus, uh, as many ancient writers, uh, uses hyperbole here. Uh, I think it seems probably too obvious to say, but worth noting that uh, Christian orthodoxy doesn't uh, condone, you know, cutting off a part of the body <laughs> uh, in order to, uh, in a in a kind of literal interpretation of this. But it is, uh, you know, having said that, right, that when that's not to be taken literally. I think it is a word of law, right, a word of judgment uh, that it would be um, unwise of us to ignore. Um, it may be uncomfortable, but uh, there, there, there is a place for uh, for judgment and for talking about judgment uh, in in your sermon. I I think about this. I, I'm thinking back uh, several years now. I was listening to the radio NPR as I was driving home, and this was in the midst of one of the many uh, uh, child abuse scandals in the Catholic Church. This one in particular in our area where we live in the Twin Cities of Minnesota. And they were interviewing um, the new archbishop, the one who had replaced, uh, the one who had been there when the scandals happened. 
and uh, and the archbishop, uh, as I recall, said, you know, the 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 worst part about this is that it, you know, this abuse, this clergy abuse of children, uh, then damages their faith or may even uh, destroy their faith. Right? That 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 is one of the greatest, one of the worst uh, consequences of this. Uh, of this abuse, and it it reminded me of this uh, saying, right? It, if any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were fastened around your neck and you were drowned in the depth of the sea. There are some uh, terrible things that happen uh, to children, and especially when it happens in the church, it is uh, something we need to name, right? And something we need to uh, condemn in the in the you know uh, in the strongest way possible as Jesus does here. If you've seen a millstone, um, you know that Jesus was really, really making a strong statement here. And uh, I appreciate Catherine, your not letting this simply be, you know, if you're a thief, cut off your hand or, you know, you know, if you're looking lustfully at something, then poke out your eye. Um, I it, it really is this wider understanding of what is it that we're saying that we're doing that people see that people uh, witness that causes them to say, I don't want to be a part of that. And that being, I don't want to be a follower of Christ. That's the stumbling block that this is pointing to. So thank you for using, as difficult as that that reality is, there are so many more examples of that in our practices today. Uh, sexual scandals, oppression, um, uh, uh, marginalization. Uh, yes, uh, the, the, the kind of... Um, uh, USA only, you know, that the, the ways that we miss that God is through Jesus reaching out first to the Jews and then to the rest of the world, because this is written from Matthew's perspective. There are Jews and everybody else, Jews and Gentiles. And uh, so thank you for that, Catherine. And, and I hope that we will be sensitive to what really is the stumbling block. And how do we not be guilty? Because that really breaks the heart of God in the heart of Jesus. <laughs>